Thank you, everyone, and good morning. So uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about landscape of emerging technologies in thermometry. Uh, this talk is in large part inspired and could even consider an extension of the task group report I presented in the last meeting. So this is Neil. Yes, you need to make the right hand click here. All right. Uh, so before I get started, the standard is disclaimer. You know, if I don't think I'm showing any commercial vendors uh, products, but in case in our discussion or any other point you see a commercially available instrument, please don't take it to be an endorsement of that particular vendor. It's merely to facilitate conversation. And needless to say, the opinions expressed are those of the speaker only. Uh, so I would say that uh, being all, all of us being temperature Metrology people would all agree that temperature is one of the most important, most measured quantities, perhaps second only to time. I would say that, you know, looking into the future, one of the things uh, I would say is that what's fundamentally changing is not so much as the landscape of temperature metrology, but metrology in general, and that is our relationship to technology. We are increasingly moving away from discrete time space measurements. So having like one or two sensors located in a process or and queuing it every now and then to get some measurements. We are moving towards the future where you're talking about deploying thousands of sensors over areas large and small and sort of a continuum of measurements, right? You're taking measurements all the time over this time and space and using these terabytes of data to inform um, actionable intelligence that you can take to make decisions. And one of the realizations that comes when you start to look at such uh, network of sensors is that it is not the capital investment made up front. It is the cost of maintaining sensor networks that matters. In when you're deploying 5,000 or 10,000 sensors, you know, maintaining them, calibrating them, especially when some of them might be embedded into structures, even if you were doing every three to five years, the cost of maintenance starts to approach the cost of the infrastructure you build. And that becomes a large economic motivator to think out of the box. And what better way to think out of the box than to look towards new technologies? So in my opinion, there are three technology, broadly speaking, three technology areas that can lead to disruptive changes in our temperature metrology. So I think the most of the attention and energy has been in nanophotonics and quantum technologies, but additive manufacturing and AI can also play a role here. Uh, and that's because for each of these technologies, they act on a particular power pressure point or leverage point in the ecosystem. So for instance, with nanophotonics or quantum technologies, you're acting on this calibration services loop. Um, you know, if you can make a thermometer that will not drift as often, as a very low drift rate is stable for a really long time period, you don't need as many calibration services. Or if you can make a quantum thermometer that provides you from a dynamic temperature on a chip, so, you know, sort of like what the dream of a national chip is, that again, takes out the need for calibration services. So it's a great motivator to develop these sort of technologies. Similarly, you can see with additive manufacturing that you can close the innovator to consumer model um, gap. You can also imagine moving away from a producer consumer model to a presumer model. Uh, what traceability would look like in that kind of economic model is something that we're still trying to figure out. Uh, and lastly, when you're talking about having thousands of sensors being deployed and measuring them in real time, um, tools like AI or machine learning or deep neural networks start to become increasingly important in how you process the data and do so in a manner that gives you reliable information that you can act upon. So I think all of these are going to change how we interact with these new technologies. So most of the talk is going to focus on nanophotonics and quantum technologies. I have one slide on AI, but I'm happy to talk to you during the question and answer section or offline about any of these technology areas. So let's look at nanophotonics. Uh, you know, as the old saying goes, there's never anything really truly new. We always build on the shoulders of others. So even in these new technologies, really we have relied on what we have known or been done before. Uh, 
if you had asked me five, 10 years ago, how would you build a photonic thermometers? I think my answer would still be the same. Uh, you're going to look at the real and the imaginary part of the refractive index, right? You're going to do some sort of spectroscopy. Either you're doing Doppler broadening, light scattering, Raman-like processes, or optomechanics, which is, again, exchanging of quanta. In this case, it's a phonon rather than a photon, but again, you're doing some sort of spectroscopy to do temperature measurement in these cases. So in this section, I want to start off the conversation by looking at uh, the optical gas refractometry measurements. Now, as we talked in the last meeting, this is an established technique, and as well known, there's a working group that covers it. Um, and, you know, when you're looking at the temperature range of this technology, despite the fact that it provides a dynamic temperature, it's limited at on the high end by the material coatings to 150 degrees Celsius. So it's not, I think, a, in my opinion, a dis truly disruptive technology because it's so limited in temperature range. But I wanted to start here because I think it's an instructive point to start at. When you look at this technology, this is a technology that has its roots in time and frequency. Uh, it was being developed by people like Jack Stone for dimensional metrology and has found a successful home in pressure metrology where people are getting close to having it be widely available as a primary pressure standard. And with small changes, people have demonstrated that you can use the same base technology to make temperature metrology. So where this, you know, what you're starting to see in these new technologies is this idea of duality of the infrastructure. Infrastructure developed for one metrology area being utilized for all these other different areas. And from an economics perspective, you're looking at, when you're looking at the J curve for efficiency, right, with any new technology, your productivity drops until you find new uses for it, and then it undergoes a very large increase in efficiency. And these sort of sharing of infrastructure points away towards the future of how you can see the metrology infrastructure changing as people look for efficiencies, especially in difficult economic situations. So just keep this in mind. You will see this show up in all the other technology areas of how we're sharing technology infrastructure and know-how across different fields. So the same thing is, I think, true with Doppler broadening. Again, this builds on long history of work people have done in free space broadening thermometry. thermometry. That's really well known. Uh, the main purpose behind on-chip broadening thermometer, the main focus has been to develop a small form factor device that will fit the infrastructure that is currently exists for thermometry. And again, we're borrowing a lot from our colleagues in time and frequency who have been working on building uh, fiber couple vapor cells for frequency metrology. So again, it's that sharing of the infrastructure that's going to enable new technologies and hopefully also make it easier for people to develop new things. Uh, you know, this road doesn't just go in one direction. It also goes sometimes ancillary technologies also matter. So when you look at things like light scattering thermometry, you know, based on Rayleigh or Raman or beyond scattering, or you're looking at other fiber optic thermometry like fiber brag grading, these are again, you know, they're there for a long time. Fiber optics were developed for telecom. We're sharing a lot of the infrastructure that was created there. What has held in a lot of these cases, these techniques back is the complexity of the interrogator, right? The ancillary hardware that goes into enable the measurements. And increasingly you're starting to see like with quantum technologies, single photon detectors and counters are starting to become cheaper or more widely available, enabling these sort of measurements case of fiber bright gratings, for instance, one of the main issues has been the lack of meteorological rigor. Uh, but even there, I think we're starting to feel more confident. At least I feel more confident than I was three years ago. And that's really because we have colleagues like my colleague in Canada, Sergey, who are starting to ask the hard questions that haven't been asked in a while. And things like, what is the drift rate? What are the underlying processes? basically the question of what is the master aging curve at low temperature. I think as people, more people get in to the field and they start to ask these hard questions, hopefully we'll get answers that push forward. I'm not as brave as uh, Sergei, so just plugging some of our early work here. Um, we looked at some of these problems and said, ah, we can kind of get around it. 
by simply switching materials. And I think that's one of the great things about these new technologies. You have a lot of parameter space to play with. So we switched to SOI devices, and we found that you can largely get away from the problem in thermal hysteresis, uh, the problem of uncertainty due to large peak, you know, bandwidth, of the peak, which makes it harder to figure out what the peak center is reliably. You can overcome by going to resonating structures, and that's what a lot of teams are doing. They're trying out ring resonators or photonic crystal cavities that allow you to get to really low uncertainties. Over at NIST, we have now pushed with our particular design of photonic crystal cavity thermometer up to the mercury, up to the uh, tin, indium melting temperature with the long-term stabilities in triple point of water being around less than 500 microkelvin. So that progress continues to be made. I will simply say that also caution you, while these are all great results, that the devil remains in the details. We learned early on, in, even in our work, that packaging matters, right? Um, the underlying physics of your device may not change with temperature as much. So you may be immune to long-term hysteresis, but your packaging can drift. The epoxy used to bond the fibers to the optical chip can reflow, it can outgas, it can age, exerting strain onto the chip, so it causes a long-term change. And that can just ruin your uncertainty budgets. So as the community overall pushes both in towards high temperatures and low temperatures, I think we're going to have to continue evolving the packaging. And it's going to be take a large-scale effort to get there in the end. Other questions that matter, I think, from more from a user point of view than from a pure metrology point of view are questions like device interchangeability and mode interchangeability. And that matters because, you know, you're going, doing a wafer scale run in a foundry it cost considerable amount of money to do that. If all your devices behaved very differently, you couldn't write a common model, develop a common model or a reference function for these devices, it's going to take a lot more effort to calibrate and disseminate calibrations down traceability in these devices. And that might turn off a segment of the population. Similarly, mode interchangeability, that is. So right now, what we are doing is we take a particular mode, let's say in a ring resonator, and track it as a function of temperature to make a wavelength temperature curve. Um, that's a great approach, but it does mean that you have to use a broad band, to broadly tunable laser. And while these are telecom standard lasers, a broadly tunable laser over you know, 50 or 100 nanometers can cost 10 to $30,000. An alternative approach would be to study uh, mode interchangeability. So you could just mode hop along the different rings that would let you use a small bandwidth laser like a DFB. So those lasers only cost $1,000. Something like that would let you drop the price by a factor of 10,000. And that might make it more of these instruments more widely available than they would be otherwise. So again, this sort of considerations of the economics of how the users interact with it and how much they have to train are really what's going to, you know, make or break these technologies. How quickly we can get over or successfully get over the value of debt really comes down to these sort of issues. But again, I am a lot more confident that we will make it past the value of debt because of my colleagues like Yuji from uh, Name China and Sergey from NRC Canada. So this work here is for my colleagues in China where they showed, this is really in a way that I absolutely love this work. And what they showed was that you can use this scattering center in the waveguide to create phenol resonances, to create a high resolution, um, high Q device uh, resonance. Now this, what this shows to me is that you can be working within the limitations of your foundry setup, rather than trying to do cross processing to improve the quality factor of your device, you can use these small innovations to really get to the same point, which is to have a high Q device. So again, this matters in the long run, and this is, again, a sign of beautiful innovation. Uh, on the right-hand side is this paper, uh, this citation of this work from our colleagues in Canada that, is that we have shown that you can use uh, in swept wavelength, so just sweeping the laser, report spectra of the ring resonator. You can use a dictionary matching or pattern recognition uh, approach to building calibration models for devices. So rather than locking to a device and having, you know, just a single point measurements like that, you can take these novel approaches to build calibration models. And that has, again, uh, 
implications in what kind of instruments you're going to build. So are you going to build a more complicated or expensive or large footprint device, or are you going to use something relatively simple that software handles a lot of the work for the end user? And again, I think innovations like these are going to help these new technologies move into the mainstream. All right. So in terms of quantum technologies or quantum inspired technologies, I think all conversations basically have to start with quantum optical mechanics because that's where a lot of the energy is. And as I spoke in the last meeting with quantum mechanics, the optical mechanics, the excitement is really driven by quantum information sciences, where people are looking at these devices as quantum transducers for converting microwaves to infrared and back and forth. Um, and because of all of this energy in the field, you continue to see advancements. One of the major breakthroughs was three years ago when my colleagues Tom Purdy and Jay Teller showed that you can use quantum noise thermometry techniques to extend the temperature measurement capability of these devices from cryogenic temperatures all the way up to 300 Kelvin. Uh, work continues. Uh, the Euromed program and all other laboratories also in sort of pushing it forward. We know the things we need to do, which is to bring down the uncertainty. And the, one of the ways to do it is to improve the uh, optimum mechanical transduction factor. So people are looking at new materials. They're looking at going towards longer wavelengths and things like that to improve. But because there's a lot of interest in this field, progress continues to be made. Just uh, in September, Tom Purdy had a paper come out that showed um, and here's the citation down here for this paper. So this paper shows that you can use uh, bath engineering techniques to mitigate the effect of self-heating in these devices. And that's one of the largest, larger drivers of uncertainty in optical mechanical thermometry. So again, progress being made in terms of making better acoustic uh, communication systems are helping push the temperature metrology aspect of these techniques forward too. So we hope to continue seeing improvements optical mechanical thermometry and hopefully in the next decade start to see a realization of an on-chip temperature uh, standard. Other techniques coming out of uh, quantum computing include things like tunnel junction shot noise thermometer. Again, the driver here is to make a thermometer that is process compatible with making a quantum computing chips. The motivation here is to have a thermodynamic temperature sensor that is embedded on the same platform as your qubits. So you can realize what is the ground state of the qubit you've initialized. The fact that there is at least some hope that you can take these devices and push them up to room temperature to make practical uh, thermometers, make it uh, all the more enticing and hopefully a win-win for both sides. Uh, lastly, I think NV diamond thermometry also is interesting. Again, this is a technology that was being developed for quantum computing. And it's my understanding talking to people in the field that when it comes to developing room temperature quantum computers, this is our best bet. But field as a whole over the last couple of years seems to be moving away from the idea of room temperature quantum computing and sort of focusing on cryogenic computing with communications taking place at room temperature. That said, there is a deep expertise around the world in NV Diamond physics. And more and more of people coming out of this in this field are looking at app sensor applications. So, that, excuse me, there's a lot of interest in developing in the diamond-based radiometers and magnetometers and also temperature sensors. We have seen a few examples of people making fiber-coupled NV diamond thermometers based on nano-diamond technology. Um, and, you know, we sort of know things like, well, it can work up to 700 degrees Celsius. We can make fiber coupled devices and things like that. But what's not known is how well of measurements these would be and how well it would work for the use case, the end user. So one of the things you worry about is the spin spin interactions and also the accuracy. Uh, it seems like it would likely be limited to 10 millikelvin. So how well this works for users is an open question. But I think this is something we are planning to take a look at in the task group. But as you know, more and more people get involved and they continue pushing it forward, we'll start to see at least some niche applications come out of these technologies. 
All right, so this is the most speculative part of the talk. Um, I think, you know, we can't ignore big data, especially when you start to talk about development of sensor networks, deployment of these networks. Um, what we are going to have to start relying more and more on these data science and data analytics to be able to interpret the data that's coming in and how you take rules of physics and embed them into these data visualization and data analytics and data science techniques becomes ever more important. So looking in just broadly at machine learning, I think one of the areas of interest to people would be the discovery of new materials. Um, here's one example. This is work by one of my friends uh, and colleagues, Gilad uh, Kuzney. He was part of this large uh, interdisciplinary team that used machine learning to discover new thermoelectric materials. And when you talk to people working in this material discovery field, you know, one of the easy things that easily imaginable outcomes is you can use machine learning to discover new device geometries, so-called inverse design uh, programs, or you can use these to discover new materials for their temperature sensing element, optimize them to a particular problem. So that could be one avenue where machine learning could make a difference in thermometry. Other and personally to me more interesting areas are ideas like calibration by crowdsourcing. So the idea would be to use like a correlation matrix to identify a sensor that has gone off spec in a sensor network and perhaps use the surrounding nodes to correct its calibration. And on over on the time and frequency side, people are already starting to talk about uh, how do you extend calibrations or do calibrations in a network of clocks. So similar ideas could be applied thermometry, you know, if you have a network of, let's say, 10 or a thousand sensors, temperature sensors, how do you calibrate all of them? Uh, that becomes an interesting question and how you do it over network. I think we'll, you can see roles for machine learning in that. And on a much lower level, there's already work, ongoing work in developing uh, physics-based models for new sensors, including photonic thermometers and quantum sensors being used in deep neural networks to extend calibrations down into a sensor network. Um, lastly, I'll say in terms of the grand big challenges we face with emerging technologies, I think the first one is really how do you bring metrology into these new technologies? And this is where I think we're the furthest along. The fundamental problem remains that people who bring in new technologies and who work on new emerging technologies tend to be technologists. We're looking at it from a technology development point of view and not from necessarily from a metrology point of view. And, you know, I have had conversations with program managers where they've said, all right, I have a multi-million or multi-billion dollar program. I'm not going to pick a new technology unless I can be assured of what the uncertainty budgets are, what is the drift rate, how stable these technologies are. Is it, at the end of the day, in a lot of these SI units like temperature, they are seen as commodity measurements. So you're not going to, you're less likely to take a big risk on new technology if you're not satisfied with the fundamentals of this technology. And I think this is where having people from different NMIs working on the problems and asking all the hard questions like these helps to bring these technologies forward. Really what's gonna make and break emerging technologies is people from NMIs really asking the hard questions that give people confidence in these technologies. In terms of work, the other two challenges I think really have to do with people working together. So the number one problem I foresee is communication. We are, this is increased, these technologies are increasingly cross-disciplinary. To work in photonic thermometry or you know, quantum thermometry you not only have to be an expert in temperature, you also have to be fluent in the language of frequency metrology and photonics and communications, and you have to be a pretty good coder nowadays. So I think having this sort of broad expertise and being able to keep track of such fields is going to be a challenge. And that sort of gets into this idea of how do you train people? So I don't mean just in NMI terms, but also the end users. Um, and I think this is where with the emerging technologies, you're going to have to start thinking beyond just the hardware. A lot of us work on the hardware side of things, either building better devices or better interrogators, or cheaper interrogators. But we also have 
you're going to have to start thinking about the software side of things. How do you embed more and more of the physics in a black box setup? So the end users can use these devices readily and information that is reliable, traceable, but without having to have a PhD in all these different fields. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for your kind attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions.